A very good morning um, to our resource person, Dr. H. N. Shivkumar, sir, and all the delegates. Um, this is the last day of our 15 uh, day program. Um, we are pleased to have today our uh, speaker for the session, Dr. H. N. Shivkumar who is presently Vice Principal and Professor at KA College of Pharmacy, Bangalore. Uh, he has a rich experience of 27 years in industry, teaching and research. To his accomplishments, he has several awards. He's been awarded in the year two, 2020 um, by, uh, by Alumni Award 2020, instituted by Alumni Association of GCP. He's been awarded for research publication to 2019 of Vision Group of Science and Technology. Star Award 2016 instituted by Alumni Association of GCP. Star has received uh, RPS grant of uh, in the year 2007 by AICT. A student grant of VGST in 2012-13 and a CISEE of VGST in the year 2019. Sir has uh, authored several book chapters. Uh, he has seven, uh, seven book chapters he has authored and he has uh, re uh, several review papers and 45 research papers to his credits. Uh, he has several presentations on uh, various platforms Sir has uh, eight patents to his credit. He's a member of uh, Karnataka State Pharmacy Council and Association of uh, uh, Pharmacy Teachers of India. With this brief introduction, I welcome you, sir, uh, for this uh, program. Uh, with this, uh, uh, sir, I hand over the session to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Master Reddy, ma'am, and Dandgi, sir, for the opportunity, in fact. Yes, uh, and all my colleagues uh, of uh, Kelly University, especially Department of Pharmaceutics, uh, to provide me a podium for me to deliver the talk on the topic, transdermal drug delivery technologies. I'll be focusing on some of the basics, especially which will be useful to teachers to begin with on this particular domain. And later on, we'll see what are the technologies uh, available uh, in transdermal drug delivery. What are the advanced technologies, which are, we can we I encountered personally. And uh, I, I do have a nonprofit uh, research organization. I work with it very closely called Institute for Drug Delivery and Biomedical Research. We, where we focus only on the, uh, the area of focus is topical and transdermal drug delivery. Okay, so you are welcome to have a look at the website and uh, just give your views and thoughts. So that is a thing like any of well, if required, I'll be sharing, you can directly contact me. I'll be sharing the details of the organization. It's located in Bangalore. Yeah, to start off with, uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, we work exclusively on what you can call it as broadly as non-invasive drug delivery because I did my postdoc uh, at, uni uh, at the University of Mississippi where the lab itself is called as non-invasive drug delivery laboratory. Okay, so when it comes to a non-invasive drug delivery, uh, it includes a portal of entry or means of entry into systemic circulation wherein uh, without pain or any concern of invasiveness. Okay, so all those will come under non-invasive drug delivery technologies. So first and foremost among them will be the transdermal and other domains which I will not be capturing today uh, will be pulmonary, nasal, ophthalmic as well as buccal and even one more uh, domain is sublingual which we are working right now. So these broadly 
uh, can be categorized under uh, what you can call it as non-invasive drug delivery systems or whatever you can. Yes, uh, that is a specialization of this laboratory where they worked on certain advanced technologies. And uh, these are the pictorial representation of uh, some of the systems which have already made into the market. And I will be dealing each one of them in a uh, bit detail or bit depth in my presentation. So what is the need of the R? Okay, uh, always we are looking for alternative methods for administering drug to improve the performance, convenience, as well as patient compliance. So there are a number of electromechanical devices such as uh, inhalers or one such examples which have already made into the market. And we are also looking for safety is the first as per the FDA norms. So they should be safe enough and easy to use. And at the same time, many, uh, many of them should be affordable to regular use by anybody in need of a treatment. So this is the main need of the R. Uh, of non-invasive drug delivery. So in this, and these are some of the examples over, now, over the last one decade, technological advancement have made uh, drug delivery devices, okay, they come under a device, drug delivery device, safe, compatible, and affordable, make, making uh, non-invasive or minimally invasive also, some people call it as minimally invasive drug delivery, a reality. Some of them all have already come into reality, I'll just exemplify some of them and some of the examples which I have encountered so far where they've already reached the market, some of these. So those are the uh, niche areas which I thought I'll just uh, highlight today in my presentation. So the first and the foremost, as I told you, uh, will be the transdermal drug delivery, where what is transdermal drug delivery? Transdermal delivery, as most of you being teachers also will be knowing, involves transport of any therapeutic dose of medication through intact skin. And that's what I've not mentioned there, okay? Because there may be topical preparation also which are applied on, on wounds. But here the slight difference is that we are applying a transdermal system on intact skin and wherein the uh, drug is delivered to a distant site in the body, uh, in the systemic circulation. Maybe it may be a CNS also. For example, many of the cardiovascular drugs are delivered by this particular modality, uh, wherein uh, the drug is acting at some other site and they're applying the patch at some other part of the body. So the drug passes into the systemic circulation basically, and then reaches the site of action, wherein uh, it elicits its action or is seen. So what are the advantages of, I'll quickly go through the advantages of transdermal delivery. That is first is, will be able to uh, deliver uh, the drug in a constant manner for prolonged periods of time. And you can maintain even the therapeutic levels, what I can call it as for a period of somewhere between one to seven days. The biggest advantage of the transdermal delivery is these two things. Whenever we tell the students, we tell that, uh, okay, uh, this is one of the modality by which you can overcome the first pass effect. Now, most of the drug molecules which may come into the market exhibit poor bioavailability. That's one of the limitation of many of the NCEs, new chemical entities. Uh, the, one of the reason, main reason behind that would be uh, most of them undergo what you can call it as first pass metabolism. That is a partial amount of drug is metabolized. So for example, one of the drug, what I know on the frequently, I keep on giving example is Dicarofenac sodium. It is a drug which is made to be delivered in this category of molecule wherein it undergoes extensive first pass metabolism. And it is also prone to what you can call it as gastrointestinal side effects. Okay, that is one example. And that drug has made into the market now. Okay, you can see now, for example, there is something called uh, a new patch, which is brought by, which is uh, put forth by Zydus uh, in the Indian market. So that is what it's become a reality now. So again, there are a number of technologies which are trying to bring many of the transdermal drug delivery systems into the Indian market. And in future, I think many more systems will come into the Indian market uh, based on this particular uh, platform. So one more uh, big advantage is that transdermal drug delivery will uh, allow dose reduction and thereby minimize the side effects, especially the gastrointestinal side effects, which uh, uh, many of the drugs will encounter, many of the NSIDs would encounter, 
that is minimized by this particular treatment modality and that's what i told you minimize and uh, basically many of it, there are two types of actually transdermal drug delivery technologies one is what you can call it as uh, the invasive mode or the passive mode the other uh, can be an active mode that is active mode is which may be slightly uh, invasive or you can call them as minimally invasive or non invasive any of the classification i'll be giving subsequently in my subsequent slides and the best uh, advantage of this the last advantage of this is that it allows self administration somebody can administer it themselves and terminate the what you can call it as drug delivery themselves that is application and removal of patch in a common uh, layman language you can tell that and the patient themselves can apply the patch and suppose you encounter any side effects you can remove the patch also so these are uh, some of the advantages of transdermal drug delivery so i always keep telling um, any particular drug delivery systems okay uh, have got advantages as well as limitations so far nobody has discovered any drug delivery platform which has got only advantages and only the uh, clinicians only treat the uh, use a particular uh, uh, mode of delivery based on uh, the risk to benefit ratio eventually finally to what extent is the risk and to what extent is the benefit ultimately if the benefit is more they will prescribe a particular treatment modality for example the some of the limitations have highlighted here of transdermal drug delivery one is um, uh, many of the therapeutic agents okay may exhibit poor permeation uh, through the skin all are not permeable readily permeable through the skin so all the molecules which are come out or which are coming out um, may may not be poorly permeable or cannot be used as good a right candidate the best suited ones will be are the potent drugs and especially drugs having uh, what you can call it as uh, short half life uh, will be unsuitable okay uh, sorry some of them may be suitable also and the most cumbersome task is that uh, many of them feel that uh, transdermal patch may be uncomfortable to wear okay they always feel uh, they are putting up a bandage on the skin so that is one of the big uh, limitations of a transdermal patch okay because uh, most of the transdermal uh, film or the patch uh, is for chronic administration any any uh, disease which is meant for chronic application okay can uh, they fabricate that as a transdermal patch for example some of the examples are that uh, cardiovascular disorders cns disorders and especially pain management uh, so these are uh, used for uh, where uh, these are the uh, diseases for which uh, the transdermal patch is usually prescribed and uh, the other limitation is that it uh, some of the patches may cause what you can call it as skin irritation in some people okay some uh, the skin of some of them some of you are quite sensitive so in those cases it may cause a uh, contact dermatitis followed by what you can call it as skin irritation the next is barrier property of the skin that is to what extent uh, the skin acts as a barrier varies from person to person so in one person it may be readily permeable whereas in the other person it may not be so and it varies even from one side to another that is for example if the uh, skin in any part of the body is thick skinned what you can call it as the permeation will be poor whereas in some regions the permeation is better so there will be a lot of variation in uh, amount of drug that can be delivered and the main limitation why transdermal uh, systems are not uh, making into the indian market is one is that because of perspiration perspiration is nothing but as you know that there will be lot of sweating uh, india is a country where is a tropical country where in most part of india as you can see uh, we are associated with uh, profuse sweating that's what i can call it as that is one of the limitations with the uh, indian population so in those cases uh, it's very difficult to apply a patch the patch will not adhere uh, that well to the skin and any of the other limitation will be showering some people you, most of the indians as you know will prefer to have a bath every day that's what is happening nowadays also because of the covid pandemic in that case it's very difficult to retain a patch 
So these are some of the big limitations of uh, why transdermal uh, patches are not becoming that popular. Okay. And the last is the cost factor and the cost of a transdermal patch may be too high. That is also there. And uh, this is a broad picture. This uh, uh, pictorial representation is a broad uh, picture like how uh, transdermal drug delivery market has increased from the, over the last uh, ten, decade or so. Uh, somewhere around 12.7 uh, US billions in 2005 to 31.5 billions in 2015. So in the US market where, for example, these are the cold countries, Western countries, uh, that is what you can see. Uh, there is an increase in the size of the transdermal drug delivery market. And so uh, basically these are the ones. Uh, these are the domains in which transdermal drug delivery systems have been uh, used. Uh, one is for smoking cessation, that is nicotine patch or whatever you can call it as. The other can be in the pain management. There are some patches which have come out in the pain management therapy also. And hormone replacement therapy also, there are patches. And cardiovascular is one domain where uh, a number of drugs, uh, companies are trying to launch a number of drugs in this particular uh, domain. And this is uh, what you can call it as uh, a broad uh, picture of uh, what all drugs can be delivered. And you can see that the majority of the component will be fentanyl patch. Fentanyl citrate is a one molecule which is used in management of pain, chronic pain, or whatever you can call it as severe pain, what uh, even the uh, cancer patients also encounter. So that has got a huge market, as you can see, followed by nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin also uh, is a drug, as most of you know, that it undergoes extensive first pass metabolism. Uh, for other than that, estradiol patch also is used. Uh, it also has a good market in the current Indian scenario, as well as abroad, global market, what I can call it. So when it comes to the basic again, like uh, these are the different layers of the skin uh, across which uh, the drug has to penetrate or pass through before entering into the systemic circulation. So the outermost layer, as you can see, is a stratum corneum, followed by viable epidermis, followed by dermis and the subcutaneous uh, tissue. So the drug, if at all it is applied on top in the form of patch, has to pass through the stratum corneum, pass the viable epidermis in order to reach the blood vessels. That's the whole path what uh, the drug has to take. And it has been uh, found over a period of time that stratum corneum, which is the uh, uppermost layer or the outermost layer, which measures somewhere between 15 to 20 microns in size, that is a major barrier for formation of most of the therapeutic entities. So once the stratum corneum is, uh, the drug is able to traverse or pass through the stratum corneum, it easily passes through the viable epidermis as well as the dermal region and reach into the systemic circulation. Okay, and eventually reach into the site of action. So this uh, is one of the method by which. Uh, so stratum corneum is the outermost layer, which uh, which usually offers a formidable barrier for permission of most of the therapeutic entities. That is what that is what you mean by the barrier properties of the skin. So by uh, one or the other methods, so scientists are looking uh, by by which you can disrupt what you can call it as stratum corneum so that they can deliver the drug directly into the system in circulation. That is a thing like. So when it comes to what are the different paths of transdermal formation, three paths uh, are broadly identified. One is intracellular route or the intracellular pathway, they call it as, wherein the drug can pass uh, through the corneocytes. Corneocytes are the, are the cells of the stratum corneum Okay, they, they are basically keratinous cells, they are dead cells, what I can call it as. So, uh, some of the drug molecules pass through this cell, as you can see, the arrow mark, the one in the green. Okay, they pass through the cells, that is known as intracellular pathway. Usually, most of the hydrophilic drugs pass through this particular pathway. Then the other one more uh, predominant, uh, what you can call it as, as you can see here, is the intercellular route or the intercellular pathway. So here what will happen is, as you can see, uh, the entire stratum corneum is like a brick and mortar arrangement. That is the corneocytes are nothing but the bricks and the mortar 
okay or the filler what is there uh, is the lipid so it is made up of intracellular keratin that is what is the thing like the cells are filled with keratin whereas the mortar material is the bilayer lipid so they are basically lipoidal in nature so the mortar what you can call it as is the cement part or the matrix part is uh, nothing but lipoidal so it indicates that many of the lipoidal or lipophilic molecules have a tendency to easily pass through the stratum corneum so they do not encounter any huge barrier for them to pass so this particular pathway is known as intercellular route or intercellular pathway so most of the lipoidal preparations or lipid molecules or lipophilic drugs take up this pathway the one that I, that has been marked in blue and this is the one other than this scientists have explored one more pathway which is known as trans appendageal route or trans appendageal pathway or they are also called as trans follicular pathway that is there are number of follicles in the skin some something like your uh, hair follicles sebaceous glands sweat glands so on and so forth so if at all the uh, drug is passing through this appendages there are chances that the drug passes through the appendages and reaches into the systemic circulation this particular pathway is known as trans appendageal route or trans appendageal pathway so many of the advanced techniques what i am going to just explore in this uh, particular uh, presentations in those cases a uh, drug is assumed it is still assumed to be passed through this trans appendageal route and trans appendageal pathway so what are the factors that affect drug absorption the primary factor that affects drug absorption is the area of application more is the area of application yes more amount of drug is going to permeate the next factor that may uh, affect us the molecular weight of the drug which is inversely proportional to the flux that is what i mean to say is the amount delivered is inversely proportional to the molecular weight and one more uh, important parameter is skin hydration the more hydrated the skin is the better is the permeation and uh, the other factor which may uh, affect what you can call it as the delivery or the flux is a partition coefficient of the permeate more is the partition coefficient better is the permeate uh, better is the permeation and a partition coefficient of somewhere between 2 uh, to 4 is considered as optimal and finally it's a duration of application the longer uh, a patch is made to stay on the skin the more amount of drug is delivered so these are some of the factors which affect what you can call it as skin absorption or permeation so uh, which kind of drugs are suitable for transdermal delivery that is again uh, a puzzle many of them many of the students are not aware uh, what happened so that's the reason so the drugs uh, which are suitable for transdermal delivery it is purely based on something called 400 dalton rule uh, this is a very well known rule Uh, so the first thing is it is preferably better that the molecular weight of the drug is less than 400 daltons that's the primary thing what many of you have to observe and the second thing as i told you the log p value it should range between 2 to 4 it's a log p log of partition coefficient thirdly it's a melting point also is quite important melting point of less than 200 degrees is always preferable and many times people don't bother about the dose how much can be delivered so the maximum dose that can be delivered by a patch can be less than it is preferably less than 25 mg that is always better and what can be the pk value it should be somewhere between 6 to 9 and most importantly the drug what you are trying to deliver through the skin has to be non irritating and non sensitizing that's one of the important parameter finally the people come out with the dosage form and they are about to launch into the market then they find the drug is irritating and sensitizing what will happen is they have to withdraw from the market that's what will happen many times okay so these are some of the parameters broadly which i have told uh, yeah, which is very much uh, required or what you can call it as candidates ideal candidates for transdermal drug delivery now coming to as i told you the technologies which are available okay these are the different technologies basically there are two techniques which can be used one is the active methods the other is the passive methods uh, when it comes to the passive methods 
okay there are again passive method is where you don't make use of any additional uh, uh, current or whatever it is you don't make use of any additional force those can be called as the passive methods a simple passive patch for example and in those there are something called vesicles vesicular drug delivery system or liposomes and you can make use of even chemical enhancers this is one of the popular method by which you can enhance dhl dhl uh, so the uh, chemical uh, chemical permeation enhancers also can be used and uh, there is something called eutectic systems eutectic systems work on a different mechanism there are different mechanism by by each uh, by which each one uh, yeah, works for example eutectic systems are those in which you try to reduce the melting point of a particular drug thereby you are trying to increase or enhance a transdermal drug delivery that's one method and chemical uh, enhancers are a different ways by which uh, there are different mechanisms again some of them may act on the stratum corneum lipids majority of them act on stratum corneum lipids uh some of them extract the stratum corneum lipids so that more amount of drug is made to pass basically what will happen what you have to remember is hydrophilic drugs have got big constraints in passing through the skin whereas lipophilic drug may not have uh, other than that there are liposomal systems pro drugs is one approach pro drug is again a chemical approach if none of them are uh, what you can call it as favorable none of them work in your case pro drug can be one of the approach wherein you try to increase the length of the carbon chain so that what will happen is you are uh, tweaking the log p value so you are trying to enhance the log p value yes suppose the log p value is 1 you are making it 2 by increasing the carbon chain length so other than that there are many other uh, active methods which can be used one is by it you can call it as thermal ablation wherein you can use a label or uh, sorry a laser or a radio frequency waves or the other methods which are uh, trying to make into the market usfd or the us market or ionophoresis or electroporation the next will be some of the mechanical methods for example micro needle is a wonderful technology i have some exposure on this particular domain where uh, micro needle technology is one of the technology which can be used for certain drugs other than that filter wherein you are trying to bombard uh, the drug at a high velocity or you can even make use of ultrasound so these are the other techniques uh, which can be used uh, under the active methods so uh, one the first passive method one of the technology which is there in the passive method uh is what you can call it as a d trans technology okay so the greens d uh, trans uh, therapeutic systems or transdermal systems provide uh, what you can call it as a slow release of the drug from the patch uh, when applied to the intact skin okay and d trans transdermal therapeutic systems are basically designed to as you can see increase the drug absorption enhance the bioavailability and have a better control over that drug release and therefore they are trying to reduce what you can call it as the dosing frequency that's the main thing and finally eventually by doing all this you, you are making an attempt to improve what you can call it as a patient compliance so what is d trans so d trans uh, can be of the technology cas based on basically it may be of two types one can be a reservoir type i think uh, people can make out what i can make what i audience can make out what i mean by reservoir device and a matrix device reservoir device as you can see the drug uh, reservoir may be present in the center surrounded by a rate limiting membrane whereas a matrix uh, membrane is something little bit different uh, wherein the drug is embedded in a polymeric matrix okay that is what will happen and as you can see the left side what you are, you are able to see is a reservoir patch of uh, duragesic whereas the right side is a duragesic is nothing but a fentanyl the drug uh, engulfed is fentanyl and trapped is fentanyl and that is a matrix patch maybe in the form of matrix patch and you can see these are the different layers for example uh, the layer for example as you can see here the green what i have shown here the bottom most layer as you can see this is a layer which comes in contact with the skin that is the release uh, liner which is followed by uh, again a layer of adhesive 
and then uh, this is the layer of adhesive the gray color layer and for, above this is the red controlling membrane and this is the reservoir the whole thing is a reservoir and followed by a backing membrane this that is a sequence by which you need to go whereas in case of a matrix device as you can see here this is the release liner release liner the only role is you have to peel out the release liner and apply the patch just like what you do in case of a handy plast okay so it has no it is an uh, uh, what you can call it as adjunct layer which is there which has to be removed before application and uh, example of what you can call it as matrix will be duragesic reservoir patch is a sorry uh, membrane controlled is a duragesic uh, reservoir patch whereas uh, even this matrix patch duragesic d trans is an example of what you can call it as a matrix patch other than that uh, the company which has come out with this patch is nothing but the alza corporation the matrix patch of d trans uh, the product, other products which are there are testosterone, that is testoderm, and 3M pharmaceuticals also uh, come out with uh, a patch called Climera patch, which is meant for delivery of uh, estradiol. And Elan also has come out with a nicotine patch, which is proposed for the delivery of uh, uh, nicotine. So, D trans, what are the functional capabilities? As I told you, uh, I need to repeat again that is, it provides a consistent treatment for chronic diseases especially in the pain management therapy as point on the deep runs or any other uh, therapy basically it's for uh, chronic and uh, it uh, what does the transdermal drug delivery system or the three trans um, uh, technology uh, helps is is to enhance the therapeutic value of short acting drugs okay the therapeutic value of these drugs are greatly increased and uh, it reduces the dosing frequency enhances the patient compliance because there are patches where it can be given once a week also uh, which will substantially cut down the dose that's what will happen and reduce the side effects and increase the patient compliance and uh, yeah this is again uh, other than that it will avoid what you can call it as gi side effects and more importantly uh, gi side effect and gi variables also some drugs may exhibit what it, ideally what happens is in case of any oral drug delivery system, control drug delivery system, it's uh, better that the absorption happens throughout the GAT, whether the irrespective of whether the drug stays in the stomach or in the intestine or in the large intestine. But with many of the NCEs or new chemical entities or even with existing drugs, this may not happen. Okay, so that is a major limitation with what you can call it as uh, gastrointestinal uh, per oral delivery so that is a limitation for whichever drug gets out that gets absorbed through the gi tract the biggest advantage of transdermal patch or film is that it uh, avoids first pass effect and allows dose reduction and enables administration especially in case of something like nausea and especially in the old age uh, patients such as who are unconscious uncooperative patients also uh, this can be a boon in those cases uh, so, um, the other few more advantages of the based uh, D-trans technology is that it is non-invasive because it's a passive patch and there is a low risk of complication and pain-free, suitable for outpatients, no transmission of blood drone diseases, which may happen in case of injections, and it enables controlled drug delivery and minimizes the peak and troughs in the, in the blood levels that provides a sustained therapeutic efficacy. So these are some of the advantages of the d trans technology and thereby it minimizes the side effects. And uh, this is a slide which again depicts uh, uh, what are the advantages of the passive patch or d trans technology. It can be removed uh, easily permitting dose termination. That's the time. Uh, and it is suitable for unconscious and nauseating patients and uh, reduces the number of clinical visits and cut down the treatment cost and allow cessation of the therapy. These are some of the advantages. And, uh, but as I told you, all the drugs may not permeate readily through the stratum corneum of the skin. But there are certain compounds uh, which can improve the delivery of the drug through the skin. 
till date around approximately this is around 275 chemical compounds have been identified as as transdermal penetration uh, you can take uh, this powerpoint presentation from uh, master ready madam hmm? hello So you are on mute. So more than 275 chemical compounds have been identified as transdermal permission enhancers. Some of them I've just listed out, some of the important ones. The first one is called as Azone, uh, which is known as Loracaprum. The other one is dimethyl sulfoxide. Even ethanol is a very good permission enhancer. Other than that, polyethylene glycol, propylene glycol, some of the fatty acids. And there is a compound called uh, TPGS. That is vitamin E derivative. That also is a wonderful what you can call it as solubilizers as well as permeation enhancers. Other than that, the compounds such as transcutol and some of the surfactants can be used as permeation enhancers. And these can be used when the permeation of the drug is hampered by the skin. That's what will happen. Permeation enhancers have proved to be less. However, many times what will happen is skin permeation enhancers approved to be less successful to deliver what you can call it as hydrophilic molecules. And even macromolecular therapeutics. That is when we rely on other technologies which have been developed to breach the integrity of the skin. Some of the technologies I've just listed out today. Uh, one is antiphoresis, which uh, is based on the current antiphoresis and electroporation is based on the current but a sonophoresis is based on ultrasound waves and the last one is a physical uh, method as i told you which involves disruption of the stratum corneum using minute needles called micro needle technology so one of the uh, one of the technologies which have been uh, which has come out uh, which has been commercialized which was commercialized is called as the e-trans technology. So e-trans technology, this is again based on the current wherein uh, we use a very minute current, 0.5 milliamps, maximum is 0.5 milliamps per square centimeter. That is the maximum amount of current which is bearable, which does not cause any, what you can call it as uh, burns, wounds, so on and so forth. That is a bare minimum amount of current uh, what is used. Uh, so that is used to transport the drug across the skin. So it uses an electric agent through the skin for local as well as systemic delivery. And uh, the, the e-trans technology uses uh, current to deliver fentanyl for management of acute pain, such as post-operative pain. That is for a short duration of time. Many of these cannot be used for chronic application. That's what one has to remember. Mm. Uh, it is only for short period of time. That is a mag antiphoresis, for example, if I remember, uh, we run the studies for a maximum six hours. That itself is maximum. And so what is a prerequisite for antiphoresis? This is the principle that is involved in antiphoresis. And as you can see, uh, this is uh, the electrodes. Basic, they are basically what it is composed of are the two electrodes, what you can see here and here. And uh, this is the positive electrode and this is a negative electrode which is connected to a miniature battery. This is the battery, battery controller, which will uh, uh, control what you can call it as the current. Sorry, which will current the current okay, uh, to maximum of 0.2 to 0.5 milliamps. So, and basically, as you can see here, and the positive electrode will drive the drug that may be positively charged. That's what will happen. On the contrary, a negative electrode will drive the drug which may be negatively charged. So it basically acts on the concept of electro repulsion. The major driving force for all this will be electro repulsion. So the patch is applied 
and you are applying a defined amount of current and uh, by using the anode that is what is a positive electrode you are driving the positively charged ions or a cathode to drive the negatively charged ions accordingly i have listed the drugs here also you can see some of the positively charged drugs example is lidocaine fentanyl and sumatriptan sumatriptan was one of the recent drugs which got the approval from us fda and similarly there may be negatively charged drugs some of the drugs which have been tried or ketoprofen as well as diclofenac okay we had done some extensive work on diclofenac sodium in our laboratory yes uh, at kelly bangalore uh, for a phd student that's what i remember yes so uh, e trans mechanism uh, so that is the basic uh, mechanism by which uh, the electrically assisted or electrically mediated transport it involves several processes such as electro migration electro osmosis electroporation but the major concept is electro repulsion which is going to act and this is the mechanism that is uh, this is actual equation uh, as you can see here r is equal to td into i into m divided by zd into f this is a uh, this equation that governs the that governs the flux or the drug delivery eventually what will happen is the equation zeros down to r is directly proportional to i r is nothing but the flux or the amount of drug that is delivered is directly proportional to the amount of current that is applied but the maximum amount of current that can be applied can be around 0.5 milliamps per square centimeter we cannot exceed this because it is it is a amount that can be clinically bearable otherwise it may cause irritation and other side effects and one uh, one point everybody has to remember this all these aggressive active methods can be used only for a shorter duration of time and not for any chronic applications okay so this is one what you mean by the electro e trans mechanism uh, whereas the others are constant for example as you can see td is a transport number m is a molecular weight zd is a charge of the ion and f is a faraday's constant so this is a bit of electronics that is involved and uh, what are the components of e trans i'm just going to briefly tell you that is one it requires a battery source you require a miniature battery we also tried to build in a battery system here uh, it's almost similar to the one what is depicted in the subsequent slides uh, so the source of the electrical charge will be a miniature battery similar to the one what they use in watches for example is very miniature batteries which are made and you need a donor electrode and a donor electrode or a delivery electrode you can call it as delivery electrode can be an anode or a cathode uh, depending on the charge of the ion what you are trying to drive across the skin and there will be a the other electrode uh, called as counter electrode and there will be a drug reservoir which is basically hydrogel why it's an hydrogel because water is the best conductor of electricity you are making use of an hydrogel other than that you need a placebo uh, hydrogel also or a conductive one so e trans basically was developed for delivery of fentanyl for treatment of acute pain uh, both for home as well as clinical based therapy nowadays uh, they are not allowing the home therapy it's only the clinical based therapy uh, because of the side effects uh, that uh, patients are known to encounter that's what has been seen uh, in nowadays when the sumatriptan patch was launched in new fda so the application requires intermittent or on dose demand uh, on do on demand dosing and fairly rapid onset of action so whenever uh, you require a rapid onset of action you go for this particular modality and e trans was designed to completely integrated what you can call it as quasi disposable product where the drug compartment is disposable Uh, whereas the battery and the electronics part are reusable so you go on filling the reservoir that's what i mean to say the reservoir can be refilled whereas the battery can be retained that is one uh, one type or there are what you can call it as disposable uh, patches also uh, which uh, some of the companies even in india uh, what i know are trying to push into the market but because of the regulatory issues they are not able to bring it into the market that's a main reason what uh, what is the limitation of these technologies uh, in, in spite of all this they are simple to use as passive patch and therefore uh, the in uh, increasing the convenience and market acceptance that's what will happen so uh, this is what is the components of ma uh, major component of what you can call it as 
the antiphoresis uh, system that is the e trans one is a power source electrodes formulation and outer housing and adhesive and i've just got a pic of uh, how it looks like so this was a first uh, patch what you can see what was developed by alza corporation alza is nothing but uh, a, a company which brought about a number of uh, novel drug delivery systems uh, okay i and it is uh, uh, and i would like to tell that uh, one of the lady who was working for for alza corporation is in bangalore uh, she was there and right now she's moved on to the other companies had a lot of interaction with her and this is what is a pictorial representation of the uh, first of the e trans technology or the alza patch as you can see and uh, this is what you can call it as uh, this is how it looks like from the top and this is a surface which comes in contact with the skin as you can see here so there are two electrodes this is the cathode and this will be the anode okay and uh, this will be the inert uh, what you can call it Dep again depending on the drug whether you want to drive what you can call it as a positive drug or a negative drug okay so depending on that you integrate these two so and uh, there will be a miniature battery in the center a miniature battery in the center which is concealed in this case you are not able to make so uh, so both will have an hydrogen both the you know, for example in this case as you can see the cathode sorry uh, okay. yes. uh, the cathode here for example it will have the drug in a hydrogen and again in the anode in this case for example will be a placebo again with a hydrogen but again you require some amount of a certain amount of sodium chloride uh, to maintain the connectivity that is very important nacl is almost always required to maintain the connectivity uh, to carry the charge so what is the power source what is the amount of power you require as i told you it is somewhere between 1 to 1 to 3 volts okay and in very rare cases you may require higher voltages such as 10 to 20 or 20 volts that is what will happen okay and again it is based on a simple uh, ohms equation current is equal to voltage by resistance where resistance what we are talking about is the resistance of the skin and uh, the circuit what what will be the component of the circuit okay a transistor will be there with a feedback resistor which controls the current from the battery to a constant value because uh, the current the current strength has to be monitored the maximum as i told you it is only around 0 0.5 milliamps that should be the amount of current and uh, this is the one the circuit will ensure reliability and safety of the device and enable even the dose monitoring and many of the systems which are available nowadays are microprocessor based that's what and are uh, or custom application specified integrated circuits so uh, they're all microprocessor based and so as to current so as to control what you can call it as the amount of current that is delivered and the electrodes as i told you if the drug is positively charged the delivery electrode is anode and vice versa while the return electrode is cathode and if at all the drug bears a negative charge the delivery electrode is a cathode that is a negative electrode so it is basically uh, the uh, the concept of electro uh, antiphoresis works on what you can call it as electro repulsion repulsion of the similarly charged what you can call it as ions so what is the kind of electrodes the material of moc is nothing but the material of construction of electrode preferably it should be platinum or else nowadays even people make use of what you can call it as silver silver chloride also where silver will be the anode we used to use silver wires silver will be the anode the cathode will be silver chloride that is you can dip what you can call it as silver in hcl silver wires whatever you get you can dip it in hcl and that will act as a cathode whereas the anode will be silver uh, wire uh, so the other components for example when it comes to formulation it should have all these components it should have a solvent which is preferably water the reason i told you and it can have a drug drug preferably the main thing which i didn't tell you about this is that the drug only charged drug can be delivered by antiphoresis okay that's the first thing what the first criteria what somebody has to meet other than that it has a matrix basically a polymer gel 
it may ultimately it should be in the form of a gel and again buffer is required because there may be uh, what you can call it as whenever current is passed what will happen is there may be a shift in the ph which in turn may cause irritation to the skin so we need a buffering agent with a good buffer capacity so these are some of the components of the formulation and again uh, when it comes to the your part that is a formulation part other the other considerations which had to be looked into are one is a drug solubility and stability whether it is stable under the applied current biocompatibility and as i told you water is a solvent ethanol can be used uh, again if at all any solubility of the drug is there solubility issue of the drug is there we can make use of ethanol ethanol glycerol propylene glycol and polyethylene glycol any of these can be tried uh, suppose uh, you need to make use of them so drug attributes this is very important especially for this drug attributes the prime consideration what you need to look into is that the first one is aqueous solubility it has to be having good water solubility and you need a counter ion must be biocompatible counter ion is usually we use sodium chloride halide drug that is what as i told you halide drug are preferred when using a silver uh, anode and the drug salt that completely dissociates leads to more efficient drug delivery that is that uh, the drug whichever you are trying to use or trying to deliver should dissociate for example diclofenac sodium will dissociate into diclofenac and sodium ions similarly with potassium sodium so similarly with naproxen sodium something like this and they should not alter what you can call it as the ph drastically and the matrix material as you can see should be easily applied by the user and leave no residue and the drug loaded hydrogel usually the drug is mixed with a solvent and a non polarizing polymer any polymer will do this purpose especially uh, un, uh, non ionic polymers are the preferred one something like hpmc is the preferred one rather than sodium cmc and the drug solution loaded into an absorbent porous material such as a cotton wool or a hydrophilic fiber fabric or a porous film that will form what you can call it as the placebo uh, electrode again the hydrophilic polymer or incorporated into the fact into the fabric to improve what you can call it as hydration kinetics other than this and these are the other criteria what we need to look at wherein uh, whenever for example drug solubility profile you need has to be done and the ph of maximum stability of the drug has to be identified and skin is perm selective perm selective is the isoelectric uh, point of the skin is found to be around 4 so accordingly uh, the permeability of the skin changes with the ph that is what i mean to say as perm selective as ph increases what will happen is the skin gains a negative charge that's what will happen okay and cationic drugs are better delivered at basic ph this is what you can call it as a thumb rule cationic drugs are delivered better at the basic ph whereas the anionic drugs are delivered better at the acidic ph so this is some of the uh, points which you need to remember and uh, this was the first approved commercial antiphoresis patch was lidocaine uh, lidocyte which was developed for delivery of lidocaine for dermal anesthesia as you can see and this is the one and again it was a reusable battery and things it had other other features something like this this was the first one which was used mm. it was powered with again all the other features flexible interconnected module things like that and uh, this is the patch which was launched off late actually uh, this is basically of sumatriptan sumatriptan antiphoretic patch and see as you can see the uh, application is around the amount of drug that has to be delivered is around 6.5 mg in a period of 4 hours that is the amount that has to be delivered and uh, but the limitation of uh, see this is what i could tell you and uh, this is these are the two electrodes what you can see and this is the battery operated uh, what you can call it as battery the miniature battery which is there it can be activated by using an activation button and these are the two electrodes 
one is the medicated pad wherein you can apply the gel and this is what you can call it as the salt pad where it is a simple placebo gel but what used to happen is in case of security patch uh, patients used to wear this and sleep that's what will happen okay many a times and so what will happen is it usually causes severe redness pain and skin discoloration and blistering and uh, these were some of the limitations what uh, they could observe with the security patch and uh, there are other patches which are known as which can be used in clinics for example some of them i have exemplified here one is foreser and the other is dupel system these are the ones what you can call this a bigger system which the doctor himself will monitor as you can see yes there's a and this will even monitor the dose what is the maximum dose uh, it can be applied it will even monitor the current so all these features can be done one is uh, foreser and the uh, uh, dupel so these are the two systems which can be used other than that and the foreser is the one which is almost made into the market other than that i'll just brief about the other techniques one is electroporation the difference between antiphoresis and electroporation is that here we use high voltage pulses the pulses are very of very high voltage but for very short period of times that is for few seconds or milliseconds that's what is done to increase the transport of the skin the technique creates what you can call it as force to increase the skin permeability that is the basic mechanism that is underlying this uh, electroporation and uh, other than that the techniques uh, other techniques briefly i would go through there's something something called liposomal technique also liposomal technology wherein people use what you can call it as liposomes or neosomes to deliver the drug across the stratum corneum and here people use uh, different uh, words and different uh, nomenclature for this they are also called as ultra deformable liposomes or what you can call it as flexosomes also is one of the word that is used as you can see uh, these are the micelli and uh, these are can be rendered ultra flexible they are made uh, highly flexible uh, by using flex enhancers okay the, they are made ultra flexible so that you can see the drug passes through the uh, mortar and see that is how it is delivered through the intercellular pathway that is what will happen so they become so flexible so they pass only along the lipoidal pathway that is the proposed mechanism Uh, and these are known as ultra deformable liposomes or flexosomes so this is one more uh, what you can call it as drug delivery technology almost a passive one which are known as micellar drug delivery technology and other than that there are ultrasound or sonophoresis is also it is also called as phonophoresis which is involved in the drug transport and uh, this is the frequency that is used to reduce the uh, resistance of the skin they make use of a frequency of nearly Uh, 20 kilohertz to around a little bit higher also can be used, and this is a sonophore, which is approved by USFDA again for the clinics for local dermal anesthesia. Again, again dermal anesthesia, like a clinician will apply this. Okay, again the patients are not allowed to use it themselves by themselves. Yeah. Okay. Okay. हेलो हेलो हाँ द स्लाइड इज़ आई एम नॉट एबल टू चेंज द स्लाइड आई थिंक आई थिंक मैं भी इंटरनेट इश्यू या 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 बिकॉज़ देर आर सम पीपल हु आर लॉग्ड इन फ्रॉम हियर माय स्लाइड्स आर नॉट चेंजिंग प्लीज गिव इट टाइम Yeah, yeah. Shukumar, Doctor Shukumar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What you do? Just uh, come out on the slide sharing, screen sharing, and again rejoin. Okay, okay, I'll do that.
I think now it's fine. Now it's fine, I think. Yeah, okay, okay, you can continue, please. Yeah, sorry for, sorry for the inconvenience. No issue, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, this is Sona 4, which is approved again by USFDA for delivery of what you can call it as thermal anesthesia. And this again has to be used in clinics, not by the patient again. There are certain restrictions for this. And uh, these are, uh, so this is an overall picture, like what all methods are available. Uh, in the final picture, like uh, for uh, enhanced, these are different technologies, in fact, on what can be used for delivery of the drug uh, through the skin. Uh, this gives a gross uh, outline of all the technologies, everything, including micro needles also. And there is something called, other than that, there is something called high, you can bombard the particles with high velocity devices, either a powder or a liquid jet injection. The high velocity, as you can see, and the velocity is in the order of uh, uh, around 100 to 200 meters per second to puncture the skin and deliver the drug directly. Uh, this is already there in the market and uh, usually for uh, uh, delivery of what you can call it as vaccines, things like that. A jet injector is a needle-free device. It's almost similar to the, what you can call it as uh, uh, in, injection delivering electronically controlled dose of the medication, which results in uh, improved consistency of delivery and reduce the pain to the patient. Mainly the, uh, the reason for that is to reduce the pain. So this is one jet injector, which has been devised. Uh, as you can see, it is called as jet injector and the orifice diameter is somewhere between, it's in a micron range particles, 50 to 360 microns. And this is basically used to deliver the drug into different layers of the skin, such as you, uh, by monitoring what you can call it as a speed, you can monitor whether it can be delivered into the dermis or into the subcutaneous region or intramuscular by changing the jet velocity and even the orifice diameter. And the major advantage could be it is safe and it is needle free. The best is needle free and avoidance of accidental uh, needle pricks also. Uh, that is one of the advantages and it is used for delivery of growth hormones. The last technology which I'm going to cover today is of uh, micro needle technology, which we have started uh, some developments in our lab also, where these are the micro needles, what you can see. These are solid, uh, there are different types of micro needles again. One is solid, there may be coated micro needles, there may be disposable micro needles, and uh, there may be uh, hollow micro needles also. There is something called soluble micro needles, also dissolvable, that is a category C. These are also called as soluble micro needles. So these basically physically disrupt or mechanically disrupt the stratum corneum, thereby increasing what you can call it as a formation of the drugs. That's a basic uh, mode of uh, by how they work. Mm. And uh, overall, uh, this is how. Mm. So th this is one of the devices for what you can call it as uh, for delivery of influenza vaccine. Um, this is a device, again, it's called as Micron Jet. Uh, it's again based on micro needle based uh, device, which is licensed again for intradermal delivery of vaccines and uh, drugs. So basically what I can see is uh, they're used for delivery of once, a life, once in lifetime delivery, such as vaccines can be delivered by micro needle technology because you cannot call them as non-invasive they are minimally invasive that is what i can tell uh, they are not totally uh, free from invasiveness so with this uh, uh, i am completing any of to hurry up the last few slides as you could see uh, because the quantum what i what i wanted to deliver was quite big uh, so this in brief about different uh, transdermal drug delivery technologies if you have any questions uh, uh, you are please welcome to uh, raise your questions, please. I'm motivated. We push delegates to ask questions if they want. Delegate side. Uh, sir, I have one question. Yeah, please, ma'am. Uh, 
Sir, if we are preparing some uh, nanotechnology based delivery systems like vesicular systems or nanoparticles, uh. or the transdermal delivery, okay. then we can prepare some vesicles or uh, nanoparticles and then we can incorporate into the gel or the patch form. Okay. So what would be the particle size required to effectively cross the stratum for the stratum for the for effective delivery of the drug? Particles. Uh. Yeah, yeah, I got your point. I got, I got your point. Madam, uh, there is uh, no proof till date where uh, nanoparticles have been delivered through the skin. That's one thing what I wanted to make it very clear to most of the audience. Uh, particles, particle, particle delivery is again a question mark. Nobody has uh, proved with what you can call it as um, using any advanced technologies uh, that uh, particles can be delivered through the skin. Again, as you were likely told, it can be a nano gel or a liposomal technology you can make use of, where you can say as ultra, you can see here, ultra deformable liposomes, yes, wherein, yes. Uh, yeah, this can be one of the treatment modality what you can look at, uh, where it is called as ultra flexible. Uh, you can make use of something called uh, flex enhancers, the yes, flexibility. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you can make use of uh, some of the surfactants itself as flex enhancers, flex, F-L-E-X. Uh, it is It is not flux, it is F-L-E-X flex. Yes. So you can make them more flexible. In fact, liposomes can be prepared mm -hmm. and the bilayer lipids can be rendered more flexible by using uh, some of the surfactants. Example is sodium cholate and sodium deoxycholate. Okay. These two are the ones which are used. Uh, there was a company called Idea, uh, that is a German company, which was launched, uh, which had launched this product eventually uh, for treatment of what you can call it as uh, arthritis, such as uh, knee pain, like uh, things like this. But finally, when they were launching the product, ultimately they found out there was no significant difference. Uh, though theoretically, we tell that uh, this is what the company had come up with uh, those days, I'm telling you, maybe around 10 years back, I remember. Uh, when I was in US, I think I remember, uh, they had come out with uh, this ultra flexible or ultra deformable also they use uh, liposomes. And uh, yes. this is what uh, this is what is the proposition. The mechanism is something like this. It is likely to pass between the keratinized cells or the corneocytes and then it is supposed to pass like this. And as yes. you can see here, this is the pictorial representation what they had demonstrated and they filed a patent also. But finally, what happened is uh, they could not see a big difference between this and the conventional preparation also. Okay. That is also, yeah. So this, uh, again, uh, it didn't come up. It didn't reach the market, what I can say. Uh, so these are some of the limitations. Nanoparticles too, I have no uh, idea at all. Uh, like uh, till day, I don't think, uh, as per my knowledge goes, I don't think you know, nanoparticles are going to permeate through the skin is still a question mark. I don't uh, endorse that. But this is one modality which people are still trying whether it can work or not. Uh, but again, uh, it's a liposomal system, conventional liposome, which is made deformable yes, or ultra deformable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sir. Thanks. Any questions from the delegates? Yes, sir. We have one question. Hmm? From the delegates, we have one question, sir. We'll read out. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. What is the role of PKA of APA in TDDS? What role is the of, role of PKA? Uh, PKA, especially oh. the role, a big role it plays, especially in the case of what you can call it as, when you use uh, some of the technique what I mentioned today, uh, such as antiphoresis, for example. Uh, when it happens, for example, diclofenac sodium itself, if I take, the PKA is 4. And that is what will happen. And uh, below 4, it is unionized. And above 4, it is ionized. So we have to, so the formulation has to be maintained at a pH of above 4 or 7.4. You, uh, you have to ensure that the pH is more than that. So the diclofenac remains in the ionized state. Hope I was able to convey it to you. Yes, sir. Sir, we have another yeah. one question. Yeah. The adverse effect of carnation enhancer used in TTDS on skin have been evaluated? 
yeah they have been evaluated and even some of uh, for example most of the indians we claim that uh, terpenes are of indian origin they are of natural origin also they tell and they are free from uh, what you can call it as uh, that's what we claim being indians we claim that uh, they are free from any side effects but you know that many of the terpenes for example cause irritation including camphor i think has been proposed as one of the permission and answers but the adverse effect is that they cause redness of the skin and uh, they uh, even for example dmso for example dmso is used by our uh, chemistry counterparts as a solubilizer so it solubilizes everything so there are what you can call it as potential of the chemical permission enhances to what you can call it as to damage the skin that's what will happen eventually and it's okay for example if you are using uh, any transdermal patch for once a week it's fine even if the damage is occur but what will happen if uh, some patient is advised to use it for a long term for example like cardiovascular disease or rheumatoid arthritis it's very difficult in those cases the patient complaints is bare minimum that's what is likely to happen hope i was able to con convey in any further question from the delegate side you can unmute and ask okay no questions sir i dr arjuna on behalf of kd college of pharmacy and my own behalf thank you sir for accept, accepting our urgent invitation invitation that we did with you yesterday sir only we requested you to fill up this morning session and yeah, without man. any delay you accepted our invitation thank you sir for that that's what we can say the expertise and um, in the in this session uh, sir has touched upon many aspects of the transdermal drug development system uh, which uh, includes the advantages and limitations of uh, transdermal drug development system pathways of drug permeation then factors affecting skin absorption different approaches used in the transdermal drug development systems uh, with some commercially available products and also the formulation considerations so once again i thank you sir for your kind cooperation and spending your valuable time and expertise with us thank you sir thank you so much and uh, we uh, shortly we will have the second session thank you sir thank you so much sir yeah thank you ma'am yeah. thank you again i thank kandigi uh, sir i thank yes, rajeshwari madam i thank the other other uh, my colleagues of the uh, pharmaceuticals department for the yes, opportunity sir. in fact thank you yes, thank you thank, thank you, you one and all please take care thank you yes sir thank you bye okay okay this uh, first session for the morning uh, good morning madam uh vandana madam yeah good morning good morning uh Uh, dear participants, we have the second uh, speaker of the day, a very eminent personality. And uh, Madam, can we request the uh, request you that we can have a short break and uh, start it uh, in another a few minutes? Sure, I am okay. Let me yeah. know when should I join. Uh, so if uh, the participants can take a small break, uh, Madam, we will end the session and we will uh, rejoin. so that the recording uh, we got to complete the recording formalities um sure in the meantime um so we will join back at uh, 11:30 ma'am okay sharp at uh, all the participants please join sharp at 11:30 for the second session